So today, um, my primary goal for you is to learn about pyruvate dehydrogenase. Essentially, we talked about the breakdown of sugars. We haven't talked about the breakdown of proteins and fatty acids yet, but so far we talked about the breakdown of sugars, all sugars almost. Uh, we talked about glucose, fructose, and all the other sugars that we commonly eat, okay? And what you should notice is that a lot of these things will converge to pyruvate. The end product for your glycolysis is pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to get used by different mechanisms, and we talked about one where it can be used to do fermentation, to produce you biofuels or biochemicals or whatever, okay? So you can do that. Today, we're going to talk about respiration, sort of how to use pyruvate to generate energy. Essentially, what happens is, in the respiration chain, okay, or the, in the respiration process, one of the first things that it has to happen is pyruvate is going to get converted to this thing called acetyl-CoA. So stage one of your three stages of respiration, stage one being carbon from metabolic fuel, this means sugar, protein, or fats, is sort of incorporated into acetyl-CoA, right? And then acetyl-CoA, okay, this acetyl-CoA thing, by the way, this guy is It's a two-carbon molecule, okay? Because you have one carbon here, one carbon here. CoA, uh, you don't, don't, you're not going to oxidize CoA, okay? So here is essentially a two-carbon molecule called acetyl-CoA, and this C2, okay, is going to go through this process called the TCA cycle, okay? So the detail of TCA cycle, we'll talk about this Friday, all right? But essentially what you end up doing is your C2 here, is going to be completely oxidized to form two CO2s. Okay, so one CO2, two CO2. And in the process, all of the electrons in acetyl-CoA is going to be stripped out. You're going to strip out all the electrons, take out all the electrons, right? And these electrons, okay, are obviously carried by your NADH and in this particular step, FADH2. Okay, so ele electron carriers. Um, TCA cycle, what it does is C2, you convert C2 into 2C1, which is CO2, okay? You turn acetyl-CoA into 2CO2, and in the process, you take out all the electrons. Remember, electrons can generate energy, okay? And then lastly, okay, st stage three, is where uh, these reducing power or the reducing cofactors, okay, all these electrons, are going to go through this process called the uh, electron transport, okay, or um, a series of reactions that will sort of pass the electrons to different partners, and essentially what happens is you will pass the electrons onto molecular oxygen and you form water, okay? And in the process, you will generate ATP. So here, this process is the key process that can generate a lot of ATP, okay? Now, today, uh, what we're gonna do is talk about how this particular step happens, okay? This is a very interesting step. All right, so this is the overview of TCA cycle that we will talk about a little bit later. First, a little bit of introduction of TCA cycle. It's sort of in short for the tricarboxylic acid cycle, T, C, and A, okay? Tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle. Um, a lot of people also call it the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's called citric acid cycle because the first intermediate is uh, citrate. This is the first intermediate. So people sometimes will call it citric acid cycle. Um, also, it's uh, called Krebs cycle. So you'll see all these names. So you should, you should know them. Um, TCA cycle, citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle. It's called Krebs cycle because it's uh, discovered by Hans Krebs in uh, 1937. Essentially, I just, uh, on the previous slide, I told you the function of TCA cycle, at least one of the major function, which is to sort of uh, take out the electrons on acetyl-CoA, put it into NADH, okay? There's another really, really major function of TCA cycle is that it is very important for providing the intermediates 
that are needed for a lot of the different anabolic pathways. For example, um, alpha ketoglutarate is used to make glutamate, uh, glutamate, glutamine essentially also comes from this guy. For example, oxal acetate can go and make aspartate or aspartic acid. Okay, so um, some of these intermediates in the TCA cycle are responsible for making um, other sort of essential components of life. Okay, so TCA cycle is really important. What you should notice is that this entire process does not involve oxygen yet. Okay, so because of that, there's a lot of organisms that can use other inorganic sort of electron acceptors other than O2 in, in primarily bacteria. Okay, but we'll talk about this uh, when we get back to uh, electron transfer. The first step that you know, we need to really talk about is this, this guy. Okay, how to get pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Now, if the chemical structure is drawn this way, then it's probably fairly easy for you to understand somehow your alpha carboxylate is gone. It's kicked out to form CO2. And here, this carbon becomes attached to a CoA, a thiol. Okay, so essentially here, you're making this guy is a thiol ester. Right, this guy is a thiol ester. Now, here is a little bit of something that I want to see if you guys remember, okay? Pyruvate decarboxylation. Have we talked about this in our previous lectures? Where have you seen pyruvate decarboxylation? So you have pyruvate and where if we do a decarboxylation, it becomes what? Anyone want to take a guess? Where have we seen pyruvate decarboxylation? All right. So far, you have only seen like, I don't know, 30 reactions or something. All right. You have seen glycolysis. Does glycolysis involve pyruvate decarboxylation? No? Okay. Pentose phosphate pathway, does it involve pyruvate decarboxylation? No? Probably not, right? How about fermentation? Probably, right? Okay. The fermentation of sugars to produce what involve decarboxylation of pyruvate? Like lactate or ethanol? Right, it's, it's used to make ethanol. Remember, we talked about uh, yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or Zemomonas mobilis. They are capable of producing ethanol. And in the ethanol production, the first uh, step is this um, pyruvate decarboxylase. Can't, yeah, whatever, you know, pyruvate decarboxylase, right? But what you notice here is that you kick out the CO2, you end up with an aldehyde. Here, in pyruvate dehydrogenase, you kick out the CO2, CO2 is out. What do you end up with? You end up with a thiol ester. Which is more reduced, thiol ester or aldehyde? 同样是pyruvate decarboxylation, you know? ethanol, pyruvate decarboxylation, and you get CO2 out, okay? And you get acetaldehyde. Okay, this is an aldehyde. Okay. And on top, okay, on top, over there, you have pyruvate dehydrogenase, but what it also does is it kicks out a CO2 and it produces a thiol ester. Okay, remember I talked about thiol ester, okay, which is more reduced. Thiol ester or aldehyde? Aldehyde is more reduced. Why? Thiol ester has the same reduction state, uh, oxidation state as an acid, as an organic acid. Okay, remember I said, in order to use an organic acid, you need to activate it, and when you activate it, it becomes a thiol ester, sort of. Okay? So, obviously, when you compare the products of these two reactions, you will notice that 
oh, okay, so here your thiol ester is more oxidized than your uh, acetaldehyde right here. So it is not a surprise to you, you also, in this pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, you also produce an ADH. Like, like that, like that, okay? You also produce an ADH, right? Because if you compare the decarboxylated product, one is acetaldehyde and the other guy is acetyl-CoA, okay? And acetyl-CoA is a thiol ester, which is essentially the same thing as saying acetate, you know, acetic acid, right? So you compare aldehyde and acid, obviously there's a loss of electron. So this loss of electron is here in an ADH. So this is the reaction, okay? So you turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. And what you're going to do is you're going to kick out this terminal carbo this carboxylate right here, and it's going to leave as a CO2, okay? Now, pyruvate is a alpha keto acid or beta keto acid? It's an alpha keto acid. Okay, it's an alpha keto acid. So in order to do alpha keto acid decarboxylation, you need to have what cofactor? We actually talked about the mechanism for this guy. Okay, in order to do alpha keto acid decarboxylation, you need to have a cofactor, and it's called. It's related to vitamin B1. It's called TPP. Okay, it's called TPP. So. Um, on the slide, you see here that it uses quite many uh, cofactors, and one of them you should already recognize, and that is TPP, uh, thiamine pyrophosphate. Okay, so this guy is uh, required for alpha keto acid decarboxylation. And um, once you do that, and also here simultaneously, you're going to do an oxidation of, essentially, you can think of this thing as you go from here to make acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde to make your sort of acetyl-CoA, and here you produce your NADH. Okay? And I'll show you how that happens in a little bit. Okay? Like that. And, you know, so be going from aldehyde to acetyl-CoA, it's an oxidation. So you're going to spit out the electrons, right? Um, if you look at the overall energetics of uh, this reaction, oxidation is in general exergonic, so it gives off heat, okay? Decarboxylation, in general, also exergonic, it gives off heat. Thiol ester formation is endergonic, okay? By thiol ester formation, what I mean is essentially, um, like this, going to this, okay? This requires um, energy. So this delta G is going to be greater than z zero, okay? Like that. So typically, if you, okay, go to like, 顶泰峰吃你的小笼包, okay? 你会加醋, 有没有? 或者你去吃酸辣湯也可以,裡面會放醋,醋酸是這個玩意兒嘛,對不對?OK,那你人呢要去assimilate Positive的话,那就不会发生嘛,对不对,我们说在biology里面 不是說你跟別人搶女朋友那種 是, you know OK So acetic acid Alright, um, so obviously you can understand that the thiol ester formation is going to be endergonic, right? Because, you know, this guy is, is like this 
only when you add ATP it becomes hexagonic, but here we don't use ATP at all, right? You know, here you don't involve ATP, so we don't have that. But we can still be able to form acetyl-CoA, and that is because you are covering the energy you need to make acetyl-CoA, okay, this reaction, by the oxidation reaction and the decarboxylate, decarboxylation reaction, okay? So the overall process is going to be favorable, okay? And for you knowing, this is a irreversible step, okay? So you should write that down right now. This guy is irreversible, okay? At least for most organisms. There are organisms that can turn acetyl-CoA back to pyruvate, but not using this complex, okay? Not using this enzyme, right? Because if you can do that, that would be really cool, okay? So, you know, for our purpose, this guy is irreversible, okay? And this is actually one of the reasons why, um, like, you can't, you cannot grow on acetate, okay? So, if you today eat, you today eat, if you only eat fruit juice or drink beer, right? 你会挂掉，因为你没有办法去做糖，所以这个东西，这个东西不能做，不能做sugars的。Acetyl-CoA没有办法回去排入位在human里面。All right, coenzyme A is a very important coenzyme. Okay, coenzyme A is used as a acyl carrier. Remember, I talked about that in our very first class. It's an acyl carrier. It looks like that. Now, I bring this structure to you for one reason: vitamin B5. Okay, so vitamin B5, this pentothenic acid, is a key component for your coenzyme A. Okay, and obviously you should appreciate coenzyme A's importance because without coenzyme A, you don't have acetyl-CoA. If you don't have acetyl-CoA, you're going to have problems, okay? You're going to have serious problems, right? So coenzyme A is used like almost everywhere. It's used um, a lot in fatty acid degradation, okay, it's used in fatty acid degradation, and many other cellular processes, including TCA cycle, including amino acid biosynthesis, including a lot of stuff, okay, like a lot of stuff. Uh, chlorophemical resistance, for example, uses acetyl-CoA, okay. Uh, there's a lot of processes that really use acetyl-CoA, okay. So vitamin B5, okay, so remember to E vitamin B5. So you can go home and tell your mom, say like, yo, I know what vitamin B5 does. So that's kind of, you know, one of the um, added value for studying um, biotechnology or biochemistry, okay? So we talked about B1, we talked about B7. B7 was biotin, B1 was thiamine, B5 is pentothenic acid. Okay, so we talked about three vitamin Bs now. Turns out pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay, pyruvate DH, dehydrogenase, uh, it's a complex, first of all, it's a complex, okay, it's an enzyme complex, all right, it's a huge multi-enzyme complex, okay, with dozens of subunits, okay, I'll show you what it means in just a little bit, but what I want to show you here, this is actually, uh, I don't know if it's a picture from your book or from my book, but essentially the human P uh, PDH, I usually call it PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, you can actually see it using uh, electron micro microscopy. Okay? So you can actually see the structure like that. Right? You can actually see it. If you model it, you do a 3D model of what this thing looks like, it's going to look slightly like a little spherical ball, and there's going to be a core and like an outer sort of proteins. Okay? It's like an outer layer and an inner layer. Right? And then in here, you have this little thingy. I'll discuss their importance in just a little bit. Okay, so this is like the overall structure of PDH. When we usually talk about enzyme complex, like complex, usually we're referring to uh, enzymes with multiple subunits. Okay, now these subunits are typically different polypeptides. Different polypeptides, 就是说他们在genome上是encoded Okay, right. so PDH is uh, composed of three major enzymes. Uh, usually we just call them E1, E2, and E3. Um, they have their names, E1 being the sort of the, the, the one that is doing your decarboxylation, okay, the, the key enzyme, right, it's pyruvate dehydrogenase, right, the cofactor it uses is TPP for decarboxylation. Now, here is sort of the 
uh, number of uh, subunits, um, subunit or MERS, like uh, if it's dimer, it's two of this, okay, two copies of this coming together. So in E. coli, you need to have 24 E1 coming together. Uh, in mammals, we turns out, turns out we have two genes for making E1. There's the alpha gene and the beta gene, and you will actually make 45 of alpha 2, beta 2. Okay, so you can imagine how huge this enzyme complex will be. Yeah, th this is actually a large, large, large enzyme. You have 45 alpha 2, beta 2 tetramer coming together that gives you a functional E1 domain of your uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay? And then you have an E2. Uh, E2 is this thing called the uh, dihydrolipid transacetylase. okay, so essentially what it's going to do is it's going to transfer the acetyl group. And the cofactor used here is this thing called lipoic acid. We'll discuss what lipoic acid is. And of course, coenzyme A you should be very familiar with, okay? And if you look at the subunits, 24 in E. coli, 60 in mammals, all right? And the last thing is, this, this is uh, the hydrolipoleal dehydrogenase. This guy is a D hydrogenase, okay? And this guy is going to turn the electrons onto FAD, FAD to NAD, okay? So the cofactor used here is primarily the oxidation uh, reduction cofactors. And in E. coli, you have about 12 of these, and in mammals, you have about nine homodimers, okay? So a total of 18 or 20, okay? So uh, the arrangement, since it's more clear in E. coli, so we'll talk about E. coli and the E. coli version sort of as a, as a guide here. Um, what you see is the center, okay, the center is filled with, so E2, right? So um, this guy is sort of, here is the arm that's going to do the transfer between the different domains of this guy and this guy, okay? And what you should see is that then you will have first decarboxylation occurring here, and then it's going to get attached by this E2 thingy here, and then it will swing it over to E3 for the passing of electrons. First, I want to show you this thing called lipoic acid, okay? Lipoic acid is a prosthetic group that happens on E2, okay? So it's covalently bound to a lysine on E2, okay? And essentially, you form a lipoamide, but whatever, it, it's, it doesn't very, matter like where it's attached to. But for your information, it's attached to a lysine through an amide formation. And you know, this is sort of the um, functional pr prosthetic group. And what you should pay attention to is actually this disulfide bond. Okay? Disulfide bond is capable of doing oxidation and reduction. Remember that when we talked about like what hemoglobin or whatever globin, uh, you know, it, you, can, you can do like uh, oxidation and then you know, it becomes this, becomes that, and you know, formation of um, um, disulfide bonds, okay? So with oxygen present or if you oxidize two thiols, it becomes disulfide bond. If you reduce the disulfide bonds, it becomes two thiols, okay? So that's sort of the, the underlying method. The, the, the importance of lipoic acid is for, is for this, okay? It's for this, okay? That's important. Here, doesn't really matter, but just this is more important. All right. So the PDH complex carries out the oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate in five steps. Okay, so it's one enzyme, but it's going to actually have five steps in it. The first step is where pyruvate come in, and you have this enzyme called the pyruvate dehydrogenase, essentially E1, and it's going to use TPP as its cofactor. All right. And TPP, remember, attacks pyruvate, and that mechanism is almost identical to the mechanism that we talked about in pyruvate decarboxylase, okay? So you sort of kick out the CO2, and you're left with this hydroxyethyl group kind of on the TPP, okay? So temporarily, you have an intermediate that looks like that. And then what that guy is going to do is you will have a lipoamide coming in, right? So the disulfide bonds here coming in. What you'll do is you'll transfer this two carbon intermediate onto one of the sulfur, okay, so like that, right? So what you'll do is generate this acetyl dihydrolipoamide, 
Okay, so the acetyl. Mm -hmm. This guy, this thing is the acetyl. Okay, that thing is called the acetyl. So you transfer the two carbon moiety from TPP onto lipoamide. Okay, and this is done by E2. Right, this is a transacetylase. What it's doing is it's trans transfer. Okay, it transferred this guy onto this guy. Okay, so it's a transacetylase. It's like a transferase reaction, kind of. Then react the third step is you will have another reaction done by the same transacetylase because transacetylase is just transferring stuff. And you'll come in. Remember that CoA is thiol CoA, right? So here, this guy and this guy is essentially the same thing. So you pass from the thiol ester, you throw this carbonyl thing onto this thiol so that okay, you regenerate the thiol on the lipoamide and you generate acetyl CoA. Okay, so it's like a transesterification reaction, kind of. Okay, but with a thiol. This guy is a thiol, and also this guy is also a thiol. So you can transfer, you just transfer, and energy is pretty, uh, pretty free, uh, pretty uh, equal. All right, and then you spit out acetyl CoA. So acetyl CoA is out. Okay, now you can do whatever you want to do. Now you are left with this reduced lipoamide. Okay, so this guy here is reduced lipoamide because you have two. Thiol, right? And you want to somehow then regenerate your methylbemon. So to do that, you will use C dehydrogenase, the dehydrolipyl dehydrogenase. Okay, so in this process, what happens is that first you will actually use, so on this enzyme, you ha also have a disulfide bond here, and essentially you'll use this disulfide bond on the enzyme. To, uh, re oxidize, to oxidize your lipoamide here. So the lipoamide returns into the oxidized lipoamide into the disulfide bond form. And now this guy then becomes your um, sort of the two thiols. Okay, so you just swap, right? On the enzyme, on E3, you have a disulfide bond, and you use that disulfide bond to oxidize the lipoamide lipoamide returns to the oxidized state, which is this, and E3 disulfide bond becomes two thiols. Okay? Next, it's going to then pass the electron from this thing onto NAD. Okay? Well, I should mediate it by FAD, by the way. NAD captures the electron here, so NAD oxidizes the two thiols, the two thiols returns to disulfide bond, okay, and NAD becomes NADH. This is the sequence of this reaction. So this is a very good table for summarizing what the cofactors do. TPP is bound on E1, and what it does is it decarboxylates pyruvate. That you should know, okay, from pyruvate decarboxylase. Lipoic acid is important because lipoic acid sort of it's going to accept the uh, hydroxyethyl carbanion from TPP as an acetyl group, and that guy is going to like move around. Right? Coenzyme A is also on E2. This guy, coenzyme A, will accept the acetyl group from the lipoamide. Okay? So the lipoamide goes from TPP to lipoic acid to coenzyme A. One second, okay? Coenzyme A, once it passes, throws out acetyl-CoA, the uh, lipoamide is going to become reduced. It's going to become two thiols right here. And then what you use is FAD and NAD to sort of take that electron, okay? Regenerate your lipoic acid. This is a very quick review of what happens in pyruvate dehydrogenase. Remember that pyruvate dehydrogenase has three functional enzymes in it, all right? Remember that in the core, uh, I'll show you the picture in a little bit, but essentially in the core of the enzyme, remember that this guy is E2, and then on the outside, you have E1, and then somewhere you have E3. Okay, so you have these two, two different 
domains of the two different enzymatic activity on the outside of the protein. And on the E2 here, you have this arm, okay? This guy is your lipoamide, okay? And what this guy can do is you can think of it as a hand, a little hand, and it can swing to E3, swing to E1, swing to E2, okay? So it, it sort of moves around. Okay, so basically what happens is E1 will first do a reaction, okay, by pyruvate dehydrogenase, the core pyruvate dehydrogenase, and essentially what it's doing is it's going to um, turn pyruvate, essentially you're going to do an alpha decarboxylation, so you remove this guy as the CO2, and the rest of this acetyl part ends up on TPP. E1 here will pass this acetyl portion of the, the two carbon um, moiety onto the lipoamide. Right? So the lipoamide here is going to swing to E1 and then essentially what will happen is E1 will pass these two carbons onto lipoamide and then it becomes the acetyl lipoamide. Okay? So you just pass these two onto here. What happens is then on E2, okay, so your hand is going to swing and what happens is then coenzyme A, uh, this thing is it's free, right? so it's not attached to enzyme, and it's going to come into E2, right? so like CoA here. It's going to come in, and your hand is going to dump acetyl portion on the uh, lipoamide onto CoA through a transesterification, and then you get acetyl CoA out. Okay? And then what happens is your lipoamide now is reduced into two thiol groups, okay? And then the two thiol groups has to regenerate to the disulfide bond in your lipoamide. So it's going to get oxidized. So this guy gets oxidized into here. While uh, your E3, it has a disulfide bond, and then it's going to get reduced into two thiols. So you change where the um, disulfide bond is. And then once you've got to these two thiols, what happens is you'll pass that electron onto FAD, and then FAD will then pass the electron onto NAD, and then in the end, you get NADH. Okay, so this is the functional uh, catalytic cycle of this particular enzyme, right? And uh, we very briefly went over all of the uh, cofactors for uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. You have TPP, you have lipoids, lipoic acid, it becomes a lipoamine, you know coenzyme A, and you know FAD, you know NAD. Okay, so what you should be able to explain to me is what are the roles, okay, role or roles of all of these cofactors in this entire uh, reaction. In terms of the mechanism, it's actually pretty simple. E1, on, on the E1, a portion of pyruvate dehydrogenase. First, you can deprotonate TPP into a elid or a carbanion here. It's the same way that pyruvate decarboxylase uses. Okay, so we talked about pyruvate decarboxylase, and it's the same mechanism. So once you generate this carbanion on the TPP, then what will happen is it's going to attack pyruvate, right? And then what will happen is you will do a decarboxylation. So this mechanism you've seen before when we talked about pyruvate decarboxylase. Okay? So this guy will then become a beta keto acid because you have an electron sink right here. Okay? Such that when you generate the intermediate, this guy is going to end up here, obviously. Okay? And what will happen then is carboxylate okay, will be able to leave because this electron can come down and this thing can then be stabilized, okay? So revisit the pyruvate decarboxylase mechanism. Pyruvate decarboxylase, we talked about ethanol when we talked about um, pyruvate decarboxylase, right? But regardless, you get this intermediate uh, called hydroxyethyl-TPP. Uh, essentially, the two carbon are on the TPP. Then, what happened is that the carbons are transferred to the lipoamide, okay, in a redox reaction. And what, what, it, what it's doing is actually very simple because here you still have a carbanion. Um, it's going to do a nucleophilic attack. So what it can do is it can attack the sulfur. One of the, the electrons on the disulfide bond 
can go on to the other sulfur. So you generate this thiol, okay, this thiol. And then you have this tetrahedral intermediate, okay, this tetrahedral intermediate. Once you generate the tetrahedral intermediate, as always, okay, as always, tetrahedral intermediate can only do two things, okay. So obviously, um, here, this oxygen electron can then come down here. This electron is lost. You have a general base that can sort of uh, pull away this electron, uh, sorry, pull away this proton, and the electron between hydrogen and oxygen can then form a carbon-carbon double bond, and then this guy leaves, okay, to regenerate the TPP and your uh, acetyl dihydro deployment. All right, so now your two carbon is on lipoamide instead of TPP, okay? Then, the next thing is you have to transfer the acetyl portion from lipoamide onto coenzyme A, okay? So here CoA comes in and simply you do a transesterification where you have a nucleophilic attack onto the carbonyl center, electron go up, come down, and then this guy leaves, okay? That's a very simple uh, reaction mechanism that you should know by now. Right? And then you generate your acetyl-CoA, which is your product number one. Okay? So your first product. All right, then you end up with these two thiols here. You have to somehow get it back to the oxidized form disulfide bond in order to do the next round of transfer from TPP to lipoamide. So what then happens is you have to then put sort of put the electrons between these two sulfurs onto these two sulfurs, okay? So you just simply transfer the electrons from the, disulf the two thiols onto the disulfide bond and you end up with a reduced E3, okay? And then the reduced E3 will then transfer the electrons here onto FAD and then you generate FADH2, okay? Remember I mentioned a while back saying that when we talk about uh, reducing cofactors, we have NAD, FAD, right? And generally, FAD is usually found in the enzyme, okay, or um, in the uh, um, membranes, okay, because um, FAD uh, is less used as a soluble reducing cofactor, so it's a lot of times a, um, I don't want to say prosthetic group, but it's, it's, it's sort of sitting inside of the enzyme. Okay, so FAD is sitting inside the enzyme. And then what happens is NAD floating, you know, from outside, it's going to come in and it's going to touch the enzyme, okay, touch E3. This guy's E3, by the way. And E3 is going to transfer the electrons from FADH2 onto uh, NAD, and then you generate NADH. This guy is then your product number two, okay? and then you regenerate your functional E3. Okay, so you can continue the next round of oxidation, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the next round of uh, reaction. Okay, so this is what it looks like, and the reason why you need to have this lipoamide uh, in addition to having this disulfide bond on the terminal is because here this portion is uh, lysine, and then this portion is lipoic acid, Okay, and essentially what, what it does is that it will give you like a little arm. So it's like a, it's like a little, it's like a little arm, right? Like, oh, that looks ugly. Okay, but this is like the core. Okay, and then you have a little arm. And what you can do is the little arm can extend to E1. After it does reaction on E1, it's going to come back to like E2 to do some stuff. And then after it's done at E2, it can swing to E3, do its reaction. And then after E3, it can swing back to E1, et cetera. Okay, so the lipoamide sort of serve as a special connection between E1, E2, and E3. Okay, makes sense? All right, so it's actually pretty interesting how that worked out. If we draw it like this, then you can see it. Uh, this is the core E2, and then that's the arm, that's the lipoamide, all right? And uh, this is the sequence of reaction. You first, first pyruvate puts the acetyl group, okay, onto your TPP like this, and then your E2 arm, 
that, that's supposed to be a hand, by the way. Uh, your E2 arm is going to grab these two guys, becomes this, and then it's going to, so it goes this direction. And then um, after that, it's going to go back to E2 and passes the, so it's like here, and then your hand becomes like a little, how many fingers is that? Five. And you grab like a hot dog or something. And then after you do, you know, E2 reaction, your hand sort of somehow like you lost a finger or something. Okay, so now you have four fingers. And then you have to regenerate the, you know, the extra finger right here, like that, okay? And then for whatever reason, you have a hot dog with a little finger right here, okay? So it looks kind of like that, All right? So this is pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay? All right, so basically what happens is that when we're talking about metabolism and uh, this portion of the metabolism, so you, when you're generating uh, acetyl-CoA, a big portion of acetyl-CoA, like we talked about, it's going to go to TCA cycle, and it's going to be oxidized, and we're going to take out that energy. Okay, so uh, if you think in terms of eukaryotic cells, which compartment has the role for generating energy? Okay, so it's going to be mitochondria. Right? So what happens is glycolysis will occur outside in the cytosol, okay, cytoplasm. That's where glycolysis occurs, so glucose is on the outside, and then it's going to get converted to pyruvate, okay? And then there's going to be a transporter that can take pyruvate into the mitochondria, right? Now, uh, you hear uh, what I want you to focus on is that um, your mitochondria, this guy is out, this is like outside, which is cytosol. And inside, there's, a, there's an inner space. Okay, there's an inner space, and then there, there is this uh, in-between space. So here you have a, you have a little in-between space right here. Okay, so essentially what you notice is that this guy is pretty much like a bacterial cell. Okay, if you think of this guy as an E. coli, okay, so we know that E. coli um, has a lipid bilayer. Uh, this is the first sort of, this is... This, this thing is the first layer, second layer, inside, okay? So if you think in terms of E. coli or other bacteria, you have outside, okay, environment, and you have, so this, this is like a lipo, lipid bilayer. You have another layer. This is the cytosol. So if we're talking about E. coli, okay? And here in E. coli, we have this thing called the periplasm. Okay, so um, here is essentially aqueous, and then in, in the lipid, inside the lipid, you have organic. Okay, and here is again aqueous. In the lipid, you have organic. By organic, I mean like lipids, okay, lipid, lipid-like. And then in the cytosol, you also have aqueous. Okay, so uh, don't get confused like which part is what, okay? So in mitochondria, it's pretty much the same thing as E. coli where you have two layers of lipids, okay? And each layer of lipid, each one of this, is a bilayer, okay? So each line that I draw right here, uh, it's a lipid bilayer, so you actually have sort of three different zones. You have like zone one, zone two, zone three, okay? That, that will become important when we talk about ATP generation, okay? When we talk about ATP generation, you understand why it's so important like this, okay? But what I can tell you right now, here in the periplasm, pH is usually low. So same thing for um, mitochondria, the pH is usually low, right? So um, glycolysis occurs on the outside and pyruvate gets sort of transported through the membranes, okay? And then goes inside and in here, you have your enzymes like PDH and you have your enzymes for TCA cycle, okay? So in the matrix, that's what we call it in here. So cytosol matrix or outside cytosol, right? So this is for like um, animal cell. Okay, 
OK， and then sign us all this is I for E coli. OK. All right, so in the matrix, that's where you can find your PDH, where you can find your enzymes for the TCA cycle. Okay, and then inside, it's going to oxidize your acetyl CoA, turn that into CO2, and then NADH is then going to do some stuff. If you have my slides, here's a uh, interactive animation for pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's not really an animation; it's more like a website that helps you to learn pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, so if you, uh, when you're studying this week or next week, um, you can take a take a look. Okay.